So uh, I'm excited. Today we have um, a special guest, Team Brots. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, man. Appreciate you having me, Lewis. Kyle, appreciate you guys. Yeah. Excited to be here. Anything that I can do, anything, any way that I can drop some knowledge or contribute, add value, <laughs> man. I'm excited for it. Awesome. So my name is Lewis. Uh, I'm Kyle. And uh, we're going to be your host today. Uh, Tim Bratz is the CEO and founder of Legacy Wealth Holdings, a real estate investing company that acquires and transforms distressed apartment buildings into high yield assets for their own portfolio. Tim currently owns a portfolio that exceeds 4,000 many units uh, with a valuation of more than $350 million. Working in real estate, Tim has built a passive business and created a residual income that allows him to live the lifestyle of his choice. Uh, he's here to educate and empower others to become financially free through commercial real estate investing. So I, I hope you guys have your pen and pencil at, uh, to write some golden nuggets. <laughs> um, so before we get into today's topic, uh, Tim, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, perhaps some fun facts about you, you where you're from? <laughs> yeah, man. No, I'm, I'm a, a Midwest kid. So I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally and um, okay. uh, grew up here in Cleveland, a suburb of Cleveland. Um, went to school around here. And uh, when I graduated from college was 2007, um, you know, everybody's making money in real estate. So my, my brother was living out in New York City at the time. And he's like, hey, man, come and live with me and get into real estate out here. Like there's no better place to do it. So um, move out to New York City. And I thought everybody got involved in real estate by becoming a real estate agent. I thought that was the step number one in order to get involved in real estate. I didn't even know what that really was, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I went out and got my real estate license and somehow, I don't even remember how, but somehow I parted with a commercial real estate firm that just did kind of like retail leasing, <clears throat> excuse me, some retail leasing and some uh, uh, investment sales and some office leasing and stuff like that. And um, just did a lot of like, I don't know, grunt work for them. I'd go and canvas neighborhoods and look for vacant properties and try to reach out to businesses that wanted to expand or open a second location, 10th location, whatever. And um, uh, it took me about like eight or nine months to close my first deal there. And um, it was just a, a transactional lease, but it was 400 square feet. We signed a lease for $10,000 a month um, for a 12 year lease term for 400 square feet in New York City. I'm like, Dude, wow. this, this landlord is going to make almost 2 million bucks over the next 12 years for doing something one time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's like residual. This guy's got another seven retail spaces and he's got 10 stories of apartments above it. And I'm like, man, I'm on the wrong side of the coin, right? I need to own real estate, not, not broker it. And so, um, you know, fell into the trap probably that I think a lot of people do where you hear about residual income and passive mm -hmm. income and, um, that's what you want and that's what you're going for. But then all of a sudden you start doing all the transactional stuff, right? And so mm -hmm. um, 2008, I moved down to Charleston, South Carolina mm -hmm. and, um, and started investing in real estate. So I bought and fixed and flipped a house. And then I got into wholesaling and, and learned a little bit more about that. And then I got more of like buy, fix and flips. And then I got into some, um, you know, single family rental type properties and just kind of uh, gradually grew my portfolio um, mm -hmm. or gradually grew my experience, I guess, over the course of a few years down there, uh, fell into another business that didn't make any money in and completely went broke in 2012, sold my real estate to focus mm -hmm. on this other business, went completely broke in 2012, um, to the point where, you know, you're, you're I'm, I'm buying gas with the coins of the cup holder in my car and I'm, you know, eating cans of peanut butter for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it was, uh, um, it was bad stuff, man. So mm. not fun. And what saved me from that was got back into real estate. I sold my house, moved back to Cleveland, Ohio and mm. at the end of 2012 and um, just kind of started all over again, started from scratch and found some private money lenders and uh, collaborated <clears throat> with them, gave up a lot of my equity and all my deals in order to just kind of mm -hmm. build up a resume, you know, and mm -hmm. um, that actually uh, had some, had some business partners and that kind of went South. We ended up liquidating everything in 2015, 2016. And, been building my current portfolio ever since. So, um, yeah, like you said, I have a little over 4,000 units today. Majority of that's multifamily. About 10% of it is self-storage. 10% of it's or a mix of self-storage, okay. uh, some retail, vacation homes, that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, man. Awesome. 
So it sounds like you kind of caught the real estate bug like super early, like right out of college with your brother. Is it something you always knew you wanted to do? Or is there like a, something that happened in your life that you're like, this is where the money's at. Yeah. I I always wanted to be like a doctor or some sort of white collar professional. And so I always wanted to be a doctor when I was going through high school. And then I quickly realized you got to go to school for a long time. And I was a good student. I just didn't want to go to school for that long. I wanted to like make money. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I was in college, I had some different like work opportunities. Like I, I interned for my brother's buddy who was a financial advisor, you know, and uh, the first summer between uh, freshman and sophomore year. And then uh, I got involved in this like painting company. I don't know if you guys have ever seen like these college painting companies that go around and paint houses with crews of college kids in the summertime. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was recruited as kind of like one of the, one of the, um, uh, I don't even know what you would call them, but like the, the little, like the franchisee or something in that. Oh, okay. and, yep. and I ran a crew of like 12 of my buddies that summer. I did all the sales. I did all the marketing. I did all the talking to, owners and I understood a little bit more about real estate at that time and you know we'd fall into doing like landscaping stuff too we would paint inside mm-hmm. we'd repair siding or you know just fell into some like odd job construction type stuff so I got understanding of real estate and then the next summer between my junior and senior year I um uh heard about this internship like I I, I met I don't know there were some kids that I knew at college who were working in the real estate industry and they were telling me about like, there's so much money and just getting thrown around and all this stuff. And I was like, Mm -hmm. sounds exciting. Let me go in and look into that. And so I interned for one of the largest home builders in the country in 2006. And uh, again, you know, the, the, the VP comes in one day at a Monday morning meeting and says, Hey, somebody give me a good idea. And with a stack of hundred dollar bills, and anybody who raised their hand, whether it was a good idea or not, he started just handing out hundred dollar bills to everybody. Uh, I was like, "What world do you we better live come in? up with an idea?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's just hand. And I was like, "How much money is, is is made in this stuff?" Yeah. And so that was kind of the the point where I'm like, "Real estate, I think, is going to work." And I started learning more about wealth building, and everything always either happened, like all these people made their money through real estate, or they made their money somewhere else and then put it all in real estate to preserve it. And that was like a big, um, uh, I don't know, just aha moment, uh, kind of an epiphany for me that uh, mm-hmm. real estate builds wealth, it creates wealth, and it sustains wealth. So why not mm-hmm. just get into real estate right out of the gate? And mm-hmm. I knew it worked. I knew it wasn't an experiment. I knew that it wasn't going to be something that, uh, you know, could make me or break me. Like, well, I, I knew that it wasn't going to break me, right? Like, you get into a tech startup or some new company that's not have not proven it's a little bit of an experiment it's a bit, little bit of a gamble yeah. um mm-hmm. you can make a lot of money or you can make no money i knew real estate would work eventually if i just stuck with it you know if i just stayed yep. with stayed the course i knew eventually i'd own a certain amount of property eventually i'd pay it all down eventually it would appreciate in value and eventually i'd have some cash flow that came in from it too so um just kind of kept my head down and dude, I got kicked in the balls a lot for the first, you know, mm-hmm. 10, you know, eight, eight, nine years or something. I did this stuff. I only got good a couple of years ago. Right. Um, but Can I wouldn't you, have gotten it good unless I went through the nine years of struggle, you know, and you talk and about some of those struggles that happen. Cause we're like, me and Lewis are young, younger, still kind of in getting into this game in the game already. And we're looking, eventually want to transition from, the stuff we're doing to these bigger deals. So talk about like the struggles you had and then like the mindset shift and the people you surrounded yourself with to kind of get to where you're at and how you started thinking bigger. Is it all about experience or can someone kind of dive right in and how's that process work for you or or, or someone looking to do that? Yeah, man, I think that's a great question. I think, um, Hmm. here's, here's the thing, you know, like there's, there's a certain baseline of knowledge that you got to have and you got to go and deal with a contractor on a, $20,000 $20,000 rehab before you do it on a $2 million rehab, right? Like you got to understand that these contractors are going to be over time. They're going to be over budget. They're, you know, not going to be having their guys on site every single day. And all of a sudden you got to go in and kick the tables and be like, what the heck, man. And um, mm-hmm. th- there's, I think there's some value in having that experience and messing it up on a smaller project than on a bigger project. Right. Cause it can cost you shit millions and millions of dollars on a bigger project. That's good. Um, I think there's also, you know, just understanding tenant relations, understanding dealing with city and zoning and building departments and um, eviction courts and 
raising private money for a small deal. It's, it's hard to raise money on a big deal if you haven't done it on a small deal, right? Smaller like, scale, show yeah. me what your track record is. Um, there's a lot of different things that I think have helped me um, in the early struggles where I thought it was a struggle, but really it was a learning experience and, and it sharpened uh, the ax, you know, maybe a little bit better every single time. And as long as you don't quit, dude, then all of a sudden you get to a point where like, it's very hard today for somebody to pull the wool over my eyes and me to mess up on a deal. If I'm moving forward on a deal, dude, it's because every T has been crossed. Every I has been dotted. Every check bo uh, box has been checked. And um, mm -hmm. like, I know everything going into the deal, unless the seller is committing like, like gross fraud against me. Um, that's the only way that they could rip me off. And, and that's happened to me before. So now I have things in my contract where they cannot do that, right? So even in that scenario where somebody's just blatantly lying to me, I still have, um, uh, you know, things in place to make sure that I don't get burned on a deal. So it's very mm -hmm. easy for me to have a predictable return on my investment, a predictable outcome to any deal that I buy because of all the stuff that we've been through and we've learned from where now it's very hard to mess anything up. Right. And, and you don't do that without having experience. And to answer your question, Kyle, like the, kind of the, the one that you ended with was, do you have to go through that? That's, that's the way that I did it. Right. I'll never talk from theory. I talk from practicality and like what I've actually done. Um, and it, it worked as long as you stay with it. A lot of people, they want the instant success, right? They want instant, mm -hmm. We live in a, in a world of fast food and instant rice and instant pudding and they want instant <laughs> success too. And they're not <laughs> willing to kind of go through that learning curve. And so then they jump. And when they jump from one opportunity or one industry to another, dude, you got the same learning curves in every industry. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to have to go through that whole 10,000 hours in order to become an expert in whatever industry that you're in. And you're just delaying your life and delaying all success if you keep on jumping from this industry to this one, to this one, to this one, because you never become an expert in any of them. And mm -hmm. so um, you just yeah. got to stick to one industry, to stick to one asset class, stick to one thing, and just become an absolute ninja at it in order to have success. So that definitely helps. Now, is there ways to fast track? Is there ways to expedite it, expedite it somehow? Um, you could latch on to somebody who has experience, right? So mm -hmm. one of the ways that I do deals today is I joint venture with younger operators or newer operators. I wouldn't say younger necessarily. Uh, people who, who uh, have, are really good in whatever industry that they're in. Maybe it's uh, somebody who's been a broker, somebody who's been in construction for a long time, and now they want to get into more investing and buy and hold type assets. Uh, they might have the experience and the expertise in order to go out and find deals and, and project manage those deals and renovate mm -hmm. them and, and work with the management company, which, you know, the, the boots on the ground is always a bottleneck, right? You can, you, mm -hmm. you can only do that um, if you have somebody paying very close attention all day, every day, week in and week out on mm -hmm. the project. So uh, that's yeah. a bottleneck for me to grow a big business. So it allows me to bring somebody else in and feed that bottleneck and watch that project. And then I'm able to fill in the gaps that they don't have, which is like raising money and sponsoring the loan and mentoring them through this to make sure that they don't screw up on a $2 million or a $10 million or a $30 million deal because I've been through all of it and I can make sure that there's a safety net to help them out. Um, so can you get into bigger deals sooner? Yes. Um, I would not do it unless you had somebody that you're kind of partnered up with somebody who has the experience mm -hmm. on doing bigger deals and a lot of bigger deals to make sure, because dude, as much as wealth can build as much wealth as can build by doing commercial real estate, one bad deal can wipe out five good ones. And you do not want to set that up, especially early on. So, um, you can organically build and just go from a five unit to a 10 unit, to a 20 unit, to a 40 unit, to an 80 unit, to 160 units. And just, you know, grow that way, which is how I did it originally. Mm -hmm. But there's people in, you know, who have, who have like reached out to me on social media and come out to my events and stuff that have um, gotten into 500 units their first year right out of the gate. Um, and, and dude, they're still learning curves and stuff with that, right? Because now they mm -hmm. think they can just keep on getting into other deals and then they're not paying attention to the deals and all this other stuff. So mm -hmm. um, you just got to, you know, make sure that you, you're, you're, doing it organically or you're partnered with somebody who understands really 
uh, what's going on there. And uh, I think those are the, probably the best two ways to really get into bigger deals. I can tell you this though, you're not going to get into big deals if you're not already doing some small deals. You've got to just get the momentum the built up, man. Mm -hmm. like that's the most yeah. important thing that you guys can be doing is just sourcing deals and sourcing money all day, every day. Those are the only two activities that really friggin' matter to do, getting deals done. And as long as you're doing those two things, you, you're going to naturally fall into a, a 15 unit and a 25 unit. And if you're not mm -hmm. doing those deals, dude, it's hard as hell to do a 250 unit. Who, who do you think is going to give you money if you've never even done a small deal before, right? Mm -hmm. who do you, like the broker no, track record. time of day to even bid on a property if you haven't done a small deal or you don't have a portfolio already, or you're not, you know, um, arms linked with somebody who has already done a bunch of stuff. So like get the momentum, like the momentum is so critical to just build that piece up. And once you build up the momentum, just know that you don't have to wait to have a big portfolio in order to take down a 400 unit portfolio of properties for sale. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause that will fall in your lap eventually if you're doing a bunch of small deals, but if you're not doing mm -hmm. small deals, dude, you're not going to get have a 400 unit portfolio fall in your lap and you're not gonna be able to take it down because you won't be able to sponsor the loan. You won't be able to raise the money. You won't be able to get a seat at the negotiating table because they're going to go with somebody who's just more qualified, even at a lower price point. Mm -hmm. That's all good stuff. That's awesome. Great advice. Yeah. That's good. Um, you mentioned that, um, that you recommend someone becomes an expert in whatever field they're, they're in. And you, you mentioned wholesaling, you mentioned single family, you mentioned storage unit, uh, commercial. And some people don't realize that to jump from one to the other is like, it's like learning the basics again at times. Well, it's um, a new industry, man. All it's a new it's industry. Real estate. That's, it's a different asset class. The Big umbrella. I have 10% of my portfolio in a bunch of other stuff. Is because mm -hmm. I got into it and I'm like, holy shit, this is a lot of work. Stop buying <laughs> vacation rentals in Orlando, Florida, right? And then all of a sudden I started getting into uh, trying to flip some land. Let me tell you how that went. I thought I was going to make a million dollars inside three months. And all of a sudden it, I owned the property for two and a half years and walked away with about 20 grand, right? Like, mm -hmm. dude, every time I get into a new asset class, I get kicked in the, in the crotch. So mm -hmm. Like find one thing and be so good at it, understand it inside and out. And that's, that's what multifamily has ended up being for us. So mm -hmm. just kind of focus on multifamily. Um, I do some stuff in other asset classes. Like I have some self-storage and we're still actively buying self-storage, but that's mm -hmm. because I'm partnered with somebody who is a hundred percent all in on self-storage and they are the expert in self-storage. So I'm investing with them. I'm bringing money. Mm -hmm. I'm helping to sign on loans. I'm helping a mentor just from like a, uh, a structure and standpoint. And I have a lot of administrative um, people. I have a COO, right? I have a chief investment officer. I have an in-house legal uh, counsel. I have attorneys in house and stuff. So I have a lot of different things in house that I can fill some gaps for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I can get equity in those deals, but I have him operated because he's the one who has the time and the knowledge on that asset class. I'm not yeah. trying to buy into new asset classes anymore and learn it with my team my team is solely focused on multifamily, but we will invest in other stuff if it's with a phenomenal operator in that other asset class. Mm -hmm. And that person also working as the boots on the ground, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. They got to be very, very involved. Mm -hmm. And yeah. guess what? I've gotten burned on that too, right? So mm -hmm. um, now we have something in place in all of our agreements with joint venture partners that, hey, how long is it going to take, Kyle, to get this thing online? Well, it's going to take me six months. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you 18 months in order to get that done. And if you don't meet the timeline of 18 months, which is three months more than what you told me you needed, then that means that the investors who I raise their, I, I raise money on this mm -hmm. deal based on you telling me it's going to be a six month time frame, and then un, uh, uh, under promising over delivering to the, the investors. So I'm telling the investors they're going to have the money back in 18 months because you told me six months. So guess what? If you don't have this thing done and the investors don't have the money back in 18 months, then they're not earning the returns. And they did their part to get involved in this thing. And it's not their fault that the project's not ready yet. So guess what? Like I need you to scale back on your equity a little bit to give it to the investors to make sure that they still hit the returns that they're going to, that, you know, they've been um, uh, projected and targeted mm -hmm. for them. And so, uh, and so I, I, I have a document that hangs over the head of our JV partners that they know that if they don't meet their timelines, they don't meet their, their deadlines, their, their, uh, their budgets, 
and it adversely affects the project, then they got to give up some equity to the investors and, and for us to maybe bring in somebody else to do their work if they're completely, you know, dropping. The yeah. So, um, again, man, that's something that we implemented, I don't know, a year and a half ago because we had a bunch of JV partnerships that just didn't go well, you know, because yeah. people, people, um, they got into a deal and then all of a sudden they got, they got this urge to go and buy more deals and more deals and more deals instead of operating deal number one and getting it to the finish line. Right. And then yeah. it, it falls in my lap with my team having to step in and do all the work. And then, you know, um, or, or it takes too long and the investors don't get their returns that they were projected and all this other stuff. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a learning thing, man. And, and you, and you just, mm -hmm. you integrate new stuff every single time you learn something and you become a little bit better, a little bit sharper, you know, it, and, and then all of a sudden it gets to a point where like this, this, it's so easy to make money and this abundance starts coming in because you don't screw up over and over and over again, like you did early on. And so mm -hmm. now I'm at a point where, dude, I, I'm just making offers all day, every day. And we have the standard operating procedure of how we go through due diligence and I have financing in place and I have all my list of investors and I have um, all this, uh, everything's in place. I have international, like net or national and regional management companies, national and regional project management companies, construction companies that go to watch our project. So it's like, I, I didn't have that getting started. So it had to be me, it had to be an assistant that I, I hired. And then it had to be this, the general manager of operations that I hired. And then like, and just kind of organically growing the team. I didn't have a big team when I started out. It was Tim as a solopreneur doing everything. And then as I got into do, and I had 20, 30, 40 units, then I could hire somebody, right? And then I could hire yeah. two people when I got to 100 units. Then I had, and it, and it just organically grows. Um, and you're just taking it step by step, man. You know, like the, the, mm -hmm. the, the journey of a thousand steps starts with one or 10,000, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. This is a great, great, great segue into how you are structuring these deals. So, so say you had, you, you have a, say you have a 220 unit under contract. Talk about, how are you going to structure that raising money for that and what kind of that due diligence looks like yeah, just for, yeah. for some of our listeners and our audience, how, how that process works. So I'm a multifamily guy, but I come from residential. And so because I come from residential, uh, I think about everything in like a residential mindset. Um, I've never taken a class on commercial real estate. I've never read a book on commercial real estate. I just kind of like, <laughs> crazy. I, I bought an eight unit building and I figured it out. And then I bought another one. And then I just kept on growing and growing. And then I just surrounded myself with people who knew commercial real estate. And then I, mm -hmm. I through osmosis learned what they knew. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, the way that I structure deals is very similar to what we did in like the residential side. So, um, you know, from a flipping of house standpoint, there's this, uh, standard buying equation that everybody uses. And essentially I got to be all in purchase price and renovation costs for let's say 65% of the okay. after repair value, right? Like that's a standard equation in real estate investing. And almost everybody knows that, you know, the percentage might change if you're in California or right. Miami or some other market. But uh, for most people, it's, I got to be all in for 70 cents on the dollar or 65 cents on the dollar or something like that. Because then if you're buying a house and you know it's going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars when it's renovated and you put it back on the market if you're all in for 65 grand it allows you to pay closing costs and holding mm -hmm. costs and commissions and make a profit in there so it builds it in so when i got into apartments i was like well that's the equation in residential why wouldn't it be this? like i didn't even think i just started buying apartments at 65 cents on the dollar so the difference is you're not paying it's not a hundred thousand dollar house now it's a million dollar building right you're going to be on into this million yeah. dollar building for six hundred fifty thousand dollars or a ten million dollar building that you're into for six point five million dollars and what that allows you to do is i don't sell much real estate i am selling some stuff i'm i'm kind of like again, levels almost. on levels trying to um get rid of some C-class type properties in my portfolio, focus on more of the B and the A-class type stuff or newer construction stuff, smaller stuff I'm selling off in order to focus on bigger stuff. So like, you'll always go through some of that, but you know, as an overall whole, I'm buying much more than I'm selling. And so um, my goal through real estate and learning about real estate and understanding real estate is wealth isn't built transactionally. It's built in, on buying and owning long-term mm. assets and holding assets because as you hold assets long-term, guess what happens? Your tenants pay rent every single month. 
that rent covers all of your operating expenses, including improvements to your asset. And it pays down your mortgage, your loan on that asset. And it puts cash in your pocket. And then all of a sudden, over time, the value goes up and the property's worth more than what you bought it for. And your loan is less than what you had on it. And eventually it's worth double and you owe nothing. And that's how millions and millions of dollars are made in real estate. It's a very simple thing. Dude, it just time is on your side eventually if you buy real estate. And you can expedite that if you buy at a wholesale price and if you're all in for 65 cents on the dollar, right? If you create appreciation through sweat equity versus just speculating on it over time. Um, like, so you can, there's things that you can do to expedite uh, the wealth process. And that's what we do is, is we buy distressed assets, physically distressed, managerially distressed. And we go in, we, we renovate them, we put good tenants in place, we put good management in place. But instead of selling, what we do is we turn around and refinance that property. So I'll be all in for 65 cents on the dollar, 60, let's say, let's call it $6.5 million. Yeah. And it's worth $10 million. I won't sell it. I'll get a new loan at 70% loan to value. So they'll give me a new loan at 7 million bucks. That allows me to pay off my six and a half million dollars that I'm into this property for. And that's, let's, let's call that. 5 million is a bank loan and one and a half million is my private investors who brought okay. the money. So that's how I would structure it on the front end. <clears throat> gotcha. Go a bank loan to give me 80% of the money. I get private investors to give me 20% of the money. The down payment. And then, yep. The down payment and some operating capital. And then mm -hmm. in, you know, let's say 12, 18, 24, 36 months. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a deal go longer than 36 months, even my new construction stuff. Uh, we'll refinance. And then we pay back the investors. We pay off the short-term like construction or bridge loan. And then we put long-term debt yep. in place. That allows me then to take all of our chips off the table. Now I don't owe anybody any money and I'm not, you know, kind of being steered because I have to make a decision on something because I owe somebody money. Dude, that's a bad position to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, so if Are all those investors staying in the deal then? Yeah. So, the that, yeah, so it's very different than traditional syndication where traditional syndication um, you know, the equity investors will come in and they might get 70% of the deal, right? And so that means they get 70% of the cash flow, they get 70% of any refi proceeds, 70% of all that stuff, but only if the property's performing. So right. in a distressed property, dude, there's no cash flow, right? Like I've seen deals, I mean, I've been personally invested in traditional syndications that I've been invested in for almost three years now, and I've never seen a dime, never seen any money. And, um, Allegedly, it's accruing, but I don't know. Right? Like this kid's got to, like the guy that I invested in, he's got to sell the property. He's got to refinance the property for above whatever the basis is and all this stuff in order to get me my money back. Is he going to be able to do it? I don't know. Like this project was supposed to be done a year and a half ago. And now all of a sudden we're going into a post COVID world and, you know, election year and all, all of this uncertainty. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to happen. So, what I found is investors, all, like there's usually two different types of investment. When I was doing single family, mm -hmm. I'd borrow money from somebody, I'd pay them 12 or 15% on that money annually. And then I'd pay them their money back and I don't know hundred percent of the deal, yeah. right? And that's a debt investment. So in a debt investment, it's a very predictable return. Uh, you don't get the highs and the lows and the, the rises and peaks, but you also don't build wealth with a debt investment. Uh, but it's very predictable from a cash flow standpoint if that's what the investor is looking for. The other option that's out there is to invest in an equity deal and that's traditional syndication. So somebody would invest in equity, they'd own majority of the deal, majority of the cash flow, but it doesn't mean that, that it's not predictable because the property could potentially not be performing for years until the property potentially sells, you know, and, um, the, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into that uh, with, um, and, and your, your money's invested for five to 10 years and, the operators typically taking a bunch of fees and asset management fees and fundraising fees and sponsorship fees and acquisition fees and all this different stuff. And they're feeding the, the deal to death. And so the operator who only has, you know, 20, 30% ownership in the deal, they're taking all these fees off the table and it's not congruent, right? Like they're getting paid regardless of the property's performance. The investor's not getting paid or is only getting paid if the property's performing and the investors got their money in the long term and all this other stuff. And so I just, I realized that there was this gap in, in investing. And I created a little bit of a hybrid. I kind of fell into it. And so what I do is when my investors invest with me, it's very predictable what my debt service is going to be because I can turn around almost any building inside 24 months. 
So because I can stabilize and refinance any building in 18 to 24 months on average, I know that if I borrow a million dollars, I need about somewhere around 150 to $200,000 to pay the return, like the, the returns to that investor. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so all I just bake that into the total project cost. So if I need to be under that deal for six and a half million dollars, I really need to be in for like 6.3 million because I need $200,000 of an interest reserve to build into the project. And that way I can pay the investors regardless of the property's performance. So now they do have a predictable return on their investment and they get their money back in 18, 24 months. And then, and then they have all their money back and we don't have to sell the property to get their money back. Then I give them equity about, I don't know, about 20% ownership in the deal forever. So they make 10% of their money. Then they have a little piece of equity in the deal for as long as I own the deal. And they're making a little piece of the cash flows, depreciation, appreciation, future refinance proceeds, future sales proceeds, all these different things they're able to benefit from where they're, mm -hmm. now they're able to get a predictable return on their investment and they have a wealth building opportunity. So it's kind of a hybrid between debt and equity, excuse mm -hmm. me, equity, if that makes sense. So it allows, um, investors love it. And, and the thing is like, well, dude, why don't I just invest in a traditional syndication where I'll own 70% of the deal? Well, your money's going to be in for five to 10 years and then you have to never sell the deal. Right. And that's, and that's, and you're only getting paid if it's predictable versus mm -hmm. my structure, you're getting paid every month at really, we pay quarterly, but your, 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 your interest is being paid every single month. It's not just accruing like in a traditional syndication, if they even mm -hmm. accrue it in traditional syndication. Um, and I'm turning over your money in 18 months on average. So if I can turn over money in every 18 months, then, and I, I can get you into three deals versus a traditional syndication, which would be one deal. Does that make sense? So now there's more velocity on your capital mm -hmm. as your an investor budget. and it allows them to get more deals. So now they own 20, 25% of three different deals, which is the same as 70% of one deal, right? And they have their money back. <laughs> and they have their money back and they mm -hmm. still own percentage in three different properties. Percentage, yeah. And they made a predictable return in three properties versus this, this one over here where they didn't make a return. They got to sell the property in order to get their money back. And it's going to be five to 10 years that their money's deployed while the operator is taking a bunch of fees off the table. We don't take fees. Like we take, sometimes we'll take an acquisition fee. About half the deals that we do, we take an acquisition fee. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty nominal. And then we don't take any other fees. We don't feed, we don't take asset management fees, acquisition, or, uh, um, uh, sponsorship fees or fundraising fees, capital events fees, or any of these other fees mm -hmm. that we take, um, we keep it very, very cut and dry. I want to be a hundred percent in line with my investors where mm -hmm. my payday comes because I have majority of the equity in the deal. My payday comes when we refinance, they get all their money back. And then I get a percentage of those refinance proceeds. So remember the example I gave you where, you know, it's worth 10, we're into it for six and a half. And then there's a, uh, um, you know, we get a new loan for $7 million. There's $500,000 of refinance proceeds in there. And if I own, you know, 50 or 80% of the deal, then it allows me, then I, that's my payday. I'm getting $400,000 of non-taxable refi proceeds. Right. So that's what I want to get to. And what's amazing about kind of that structure is now you're in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, working on the same common aligned vision with your investors versus yeah. traditional syndication. Dude, I feel like there's a lot of this. I'm invested in several traditional, not several, but a couple traditional syndications. Um, and that's, dude, that's what it's like. It's like, dude, what the hell, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't mind in, or my investors don't mind if my projects go a little bit long, if they're, you know, 21 months or 24 months instead of 18 months, because they're still getting a predictable return. They're still getting a check every, every 90 days. So mm -hmm. versus a traditional syndication, dude, it goes, six months long or two years long or three years long, and you're still not making any money on your money. It's like, frustrating. It, 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 it's frustrating and you lose a lot of belief in the business, the business model and the operator. So this, this gets wins under my investors belts right out of the gate. And they feel real mm -hmm. good because they're like, Oh, I got my first check. This works. Right. And so now they want to invest more sooner versus waiting five years to reinvest you know, they're willing to invest more every six or 12 months just because they've seen some wins already. Mm -hmm. Love it. Hmm. This is awesome stuff. That's good. Yeah. 
Do you yeah. feel like those investments of those investors, I hear in, in syndication, if you keep it long term because of uh, inflation and things like that, is then you end up losing if you keep it long term. Um, it, for this approach, this setup, you're actually, you're able to get your money back and you still have ownership of the deal. Is that what I'm, is that what you explain? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, really, so you get all their cash back. They get all your cash back annually on their money. They get all their money back at the time of the refinance. So all their chips are off the table. Is that right? the net coming coming in? Net profit coming in, or what do you mean? Uh, just from because they they already got everything that they put in. So now all the pro proceeds from the the cash yeah, flow that's coming it's in. It's gravy, dude. It's it's free money. It's essentially. It, mm -hmm. I, I don't say this often because it just, it sounds too good to be true, but it, it essentially creates <laughs> That's an infinite return for the investors, mm -hmm. right? Like they have 10% mm -hmm. ownership. I'm sorry, not 10%, 10% return on their investment. And so mm -hmm. you can quantify that while their money's invested. But then when you have all your money off the table and mm -hmm. you're still earning cash flow and you're still earning refi proceeds and you're still earning future sales pops and all, like, I don't know what's that worth. Like there's a way to quantify it and, and it's called, um, uh, present value of future right. cash flows and you mm -hmm. can quantify it, but dude, the returns look off the charts. And so I don't even put them out there because otherwise people would be like, this is bullshit. This isn't real. So like, I just talk about the 10% return. I talk about, um, you know, they, they get, a, they get 20% of those refi proceeds also. So if you add that on to the 10% that I'm already paying them, it ends up being like a 13, 14, 15% tax advantage return for the investors. Mm -hmm. And then they get all their money back. Right. And then, and then, Hey, you're going to have some equity in, in perpetuity and you're not going to get rich off of it, but the, the cash flow is going to create a nice little residual, a nice little annuity of a few hundred dollars per month. And then there's going to be some big pops of other refi proceeds or potential sales proceeds mm -hmm. where, you know, you invested a hundred thousand dollars with me 10 years from now, you'll probably get a check for another 70 to $90,000 if we sell the building at that time, you mm -hmm. know, because it's just, we paid down enough prints or paid down enough loan balance. The property's appreciated over time, and they made, you know, a few thousand dollars a year in residuals. For the, Typically, for the, uh, how many investors are invested in your in a deal like this? Is it a handful or is it twenty? Is it ten? Yeah. So any any given deal varies. Um, I assume it varies per project, but standard. yeah. I mean, we have some big deals where we had to raise ten million dollars, right? And so I'd say our average investors come in for a couple hundred thousand dollars on any okay. given deal. Um, okay. Our minimum investment's 100,000, and then we essentially take it in $50,000 increments, anything over 100,000. I'd say most people come in, you know, I mean, there's, it, it just kind of like, we have hundreds of investors. I, I have about $48 million, $49 million uh, of investor money in my deals right now. And so that's all been raised in hundred to $300,000 increments for the most part. And then there's a few people who have sold businesses who have had big exits, who have uh, big companies, they have a ton of mm -hmm. cash flow and they're just looking to deploy more capital um, or, or uh, you know, they got a little investment fund from their family, a little trust fund or something like that, mm -hmm. a few million bucks, but they have a couple million dollars with us. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody who's got more than maybe like three, four million dollars with us. Um, I have a, several people with, with seven figures with us, but... Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, I, I don't go after the big fish, I don't go after institutional money. I don't go after like, I, I talk to entrepreneurs who have some capital and um, I'd say on average, my average investor has $300,000, 400,000, 300 grand, probably a good number is what they average. So, um, you know, if I'm raising $1.5 million for a deal, I'll have somewhere between five to 10 investors yep. in that project. But okay. again, it depends if I'm doing a, you know, an $80 million deal and I need to raise 20 million bucks instead of $1.5 million, I'm going to have a lot more investors in that project. Yep. That yeah. makes sense. Totally. Out of your portfolio, Tim, uh, what percentage will you say is an equity partnership like that? What percentage approximately is storage? What percentage is single family? Um, or any idea? So, uh, like what percentage of my portfolio is self storage? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Or, with the other investment uh, categories that you have too, what would be yeah. your, yeah, your I mean, percentage? I have, I, have uh, I, I just, I, I was looking at this like, I don't know, last month. 
Um, <laughs> it's about 90% of apartments. 90% of my portfolio is apartments. Okay. I'd say another 7%, 7.5% is self-storage. Then I got 2.5% okay. that's like office and some vacation homes. Um, I have, I, yeah, I'd say... 1% is, is vacation homes and, um, and I'm going off like dollar amounts. I got about, sure. I got about, eh, I don't know, like one and a half percent is vacation houses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and about 1% is like storage or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh office. I only have okay. like, yeah, one, two, three office buildings. They're, they're all small though. They're probably worth 3 million bucks. So yeah, it's about 1%. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and but most the majority of, of it is the equity. Syndic they're, they're structured the way that I've, I've outlined, yes. right? Most of my properties yeah. are that way where I have investors in almost every single deal. Um, I, own, I don't know. I own maybe a dozen buildings free and clear, uh, a dozen properties free and clear that are not free and clear, uh, that I wholly own where I'm a hundred percent owner of yep. those. I just, um, you know, use my own cash or kind of structured it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but majority of my properties are with investors and dude, they, they eat it up and it allows me to still like, here's the thing, dude, Equ giving up some equity in a deal doesn't, it doesn't adversely affect the deal, right? It, and it doesn't adversely affect me other than in future equity in the property. But if I can get some momentum built up because I gave up some equity, Right, like ten percent is a respectable return, especially with all the volatility in the stock market and everything. Like, ten paying just paying somebody ten percent, I could probably get away with that. The problem becomes if somebody dangles an eleven percent carrot in front of their face or a twelve percent return on investment in front of their face, then all of a sudden the investor goes and chases that other carrot. When you yep. give a little bit of equity in the deal, and you're going to hold this deal for the next ten years, what goes through the investor's head? Tim is a long-term partner of mine. Tim is not greedy because he's willing to give up some equity and help me build wealth. So mm -hmm. even if somebody dangles a 15% carrot in front of my investor's face, they're not interested because first of all, it's, it's taxed at whatever their earned income tax bracket is that year mm -hmm. versus mine is tax advantaged, right? Secondly, um, uh, they're, they're able to actually build wealth in my structure versus just have transactional income. Just like we're looking for more residual and passive and wealth building, so are mm -hmm. private lenders. Dude, a, a lot mm -hmm. of my private money lenders were hard money lenders, a single family side of things. And they're like, dude, I'm tired of the transactional. I wanna build real wealth. And so now they've taken a lesser of a return on paper, but actually it's more because it's tax advantaged and, and they build the wealth piece. And if you calculate that all in, they're making a just as good, if not better return, tax advantaged and they're able to, to still cycle their money through. So um, I think, dude, I think the Good whole stuff, yeah. thing is just a, uh, uh, it's just like a, a, an educational piece of letting your investors know and telling your investors, telling uh -huh. people, everybody, dude, what you do, what you have to offer, letting mm -hmm. them know how you structure things. It's, kind of, it's an educational process mm -hmm. and eventually timing will pop. You know, it might not happen right then and there when you sit down with that investor, they don't say, Hey, I got a million dollars that I want to invest with you immediately. It's like, Oh, you know what? Like I got a text message the other day from a, a guy who's in a mastermind, never done a deal with him, had drinks with him. I don't know, three times before. And, uh, and that's it. We're Facebook friends, right? He hits me up. He's like, dude, I got 400 grand coming in from another deal from my IRA. You know, do you have anything that's, that's rolling in the next 30 to 60 days? I'd love to throw some money at you. I planted a seed with him at dinner two years ago. Crazy. <laughs> that, that, dude, I thought just kind of. And he remember that. I, he was, I don't even think I was talking to him. I was talking to somebody else about how I structure deals. But he was sitting there listening to me talk to somebody else about it and never said anything, never asked a question. We finished our dinner, had some cocktails. And then, uh, and then two years later, he randomly sends me a, a Facebook message because we don't even have my, he doesn't even have my email or my phone number, right? He sends me a Facebook <laughs> message saying, hey, dude, I got 400 grand. Looking to deploy it. We'd love to put it with you, right? And so like just having the conversation, planting those seeds, you don't know when it's going to sprout. So you always need to be planting seeds. Always be telling people about what you do, how you do it. And that's another reason why longevity in this game makes it easier, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've been planting seeds for dude, for 12, 13 years mm -hmm. in real estate that some of those are just sprouting now. I just had a buddy. I just had a buddy who lived with me when I was broke 
when I first got started in real estate down in Charleston in 2008, uh, one of my good friends, and dude, he was broke too. You know, he's, he's, he's eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and going to work and <laughs> you know, go, going to a grad school and all this other stuff. And guess what? It's 10 years later now. And he's got some mm -hmm. money saved up. He's got a 401k with some cash in it. And he just put 50 grand with me, you know? It was a small family deal. I know I, don't, I told you I don't take less than 100,000, but he's one of my boys. And so I let him come in for a $50,000 increment. <clears throat> so that was a seed planted 12 years ago that just sprouted today. I'll give you another one. My dad, my dad saw me as some punk kid who you know, bleached my hair in high school and, and got in trouble for toilet paper in people's houses and um, was getting drunk in college and all this stuff, right? So my dad trusts me, but he never like respected me from a real estate investment standpoint. No. Uh, what's the saying? Like Jesus couldn't be a, a prophet in his own hometown, right? He had to leave because everybody knew him for being a, a carpenter's kid, right? Carpenter. So like, it's the same thing in, in my life. A lot of my buddies saw me for being this goof ass, like in high school and college <laughs> and, and um, uh, uh, dude, I was, I was silly. And so like, that's how they saw me. And they didn't see me as this professional real estate investor, you know? Um, yeah. Or maybe they saw me when I went broke because I screwed up in real estate early on. And I've learned my lessons since then, right? Now I'm a very mm -hmm. good steward of capital and, I, and I, um, uh, I respect money way more than I did 12 years ago because I went through that learning curve. But mm -hmm. again, going back to my dad, he saw me messing up and it wasn't until I planted that seed, I don't know, 35 years ago, I guess, since I'm 35 years old, you know, maybe 12 years ago when I first got started in real estate. And he just invested in his first deal with me this year right? Hmm. Crazy, right? Yeah. So how many seeds are out there that I don't even know about, or I lost track of, or I can't remember mm -hmm. that still have to sprout or still will sprout, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and it gets easier to do more deals because I planted those seeds and I planted so many seeds consistently over the years that now when a deal comes, I can send an email to my investor database and I can fill up a $4 million investment uh, um, offering inside of a 45 minute webinar, right? It's mm -hmm. easy for me to do deals because, yeah. I've been doing it so long because I didn't quit. A lot of people are watching you guys and they're like, are they going to stick with it? Do they have the fortitude to stick with it? Do they have the tenacity to not quit? Mm -hmm. You know, let me, let me see if they're going to, they're going to push through some of the hard times. Can they make it past COVID? Right. And like, that's what a lot of people are. They're, they're just sitting back. They pay, they're paying attention to you. They see what you have going on. They see what you're doing but they're waiting to see if you're going to stick with it. They're, going to, they're waiting to see if you believe enough in yourself mm -hmm. to not quit on you. Yeah. Right? And if you stick with it and you go through the hard times, you show them that you got the grit to ride this thing out, then all of a sudden they feel a lot more confident and they're like, you know what? Now is the time. Let me stroke up a check. Let's invest in some deals. Let's go join venture. Let's go partner. Let's go do whatever. But mm -hmm. it comes with sticking with it, man. You just got to mm -hmm. just keep on doing the activities, you know? Yeah. And I think it's great what um, I, I love what you're doing with the little legacy even uh, because people are not being educated in schools. Our schools are not talking about how to understand money, uh, yeah. how it works. And we use it for so many things um, and even adults too. So kids grow up with that mindset. And as adults, they don't know that the stock market is not the only place for them to in invest and be able to grow wealth. There are other options for them, other vehicles. Yep. And it's anybody can do it if you apply those principles and you stick with it and you just sur surround yourself with people that are experts in, in what you're missing, what you're lacking. Uh, 100%, so, yeah. Um, can, can I plug Little Legacy Library real quick? Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so this was, this was um, I'm sitting in on an airplane reading yeah. one of the amazing cornerstone books to personal development called um, uh, Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. And this is three years ago. I'm sitting on an airplane. I'm, I'm flying back from a mastermind event. And I'm like, I'm reading this. I'm like, I, I was five, 10 pages in. I was like, son of a, dude, these pr thought principles are so good. And I'm learning this at whatever it was, 31 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, can you imagine? And I had a two-year-old daughter. She was about to be two. And I was like, can you imagine instilling these principles in your kids at that young age when they're the most, like they say, whatever, 90% of your personalities develop by the time you're six years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like, what if I could get, what if my daughter doesn't have to learn these and she just grows up with this philosophy, right? She doesn't have to learn it when she's 
after college and after um, out in the, on the real world and, and going through the adversity that I had to go through, what if she just knows it because this is what she was raised with and mm -hmm. the, the philosophies and the thought principles that, of that. And, um, and I was like, man, I need to find some like personal development books, achievement type oriented books for kids. And so I got off the plane and I started Googling and dude, there was nothing out there. You know, they had the stuff that was like, mm -hmm golden rule and how to treat others, how you want to be treated and manners and stuff like that. And there were even a couple about like working hard, but there wasn't anything to like that set foundational cornerstone philosophies and, and again, mm -hmm. thought principles and um, uh, in, in kids' minds in a very simplistic child um, uh, uh, wrap their head around type manner. And so yeah. I'm like, dude, you know what? This is my this is my hundred million dollar idea, right? Like, I need to write. And this books. is what you do. This yeah, is so, so like, I need to write these books, but I was so busy. This is 2017, so it was mm -hmm. really when my real estate started taking off, um, and I started getting a lot of attention on social media, and I started doing events and um, teaching people, and I started joint venturing, and I started giving more access to money and um, loans and all this stuff. And so I had a few hundred units already or several hundred deals, I don't know, 500, 600 units or something at that time. But that's really like when I started growing the portfolio and, um, was taking it to the thousands and thousands of units then. And so I just didn't have time. And I ended up partnering up with, or, you know, I was talking about on a vacation with, um, another family that we go on vacation with every single year. And the wife was, who's one of my best friends from high school, super, super sharp. Um, had multiple, you know, executive type roles in different businesses from a marketing standpoint, operations and all this stuff in like the, um, in the industry that she was in, which was like pharmaceutical sales and stuff. And, right. and she ended up um, leaving that because her husband, who's also in pharmaceuticals, is, um, uh, is like an executive and really climbing the ladder pretty fast. And so she left that, she had a baby and was, was just at home, did, didn't have any work. And then, um, and the same thing with my wife. And, and so she has multiple degrees in nursing and accounting and all these things. And mm -hmm. uh, she was home with the kids. And so they were looking for something to do. And I was like, uh, actually, they suggested it. Hey, how about we write the books? Tim, you give us the, the ideas. We'll write the books and blah, blah, blah. And so I've just kind of been like the creator and setting everything up. And so that way I can yeah. brag about the books because I didn't write them, but the, <laughs> the girls did. And they're amazing. And so we, we have... Um, mm -hmm. The first book that came out is based off of Think and, Think and Grow Rich. It's called Think Big and Go to Baseball Camp. It's available at littlelegacylibrary.com. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to Amazon, look up Think Big and Go to, go to Baseball Camp. And I'll it's put a link to Principles of Think and Grow Rich, right? And then we, uh, book number two that's coming out um, next month is uh, all done. We're just waiting to release it. That one's based on uh, how to win friends and influence people. And so it's how to win class president and influence your peers. And so it's uh, it's really, really cool book. And uh, the illustrators are local Cleveland guys as well. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a lot of uh, good stuff. And then we have uh, Magic of Thinking Big that's coming out. We have The Richest Man in Babylon. It's going to be the richest kid in the neighborhood. And then there's, um, uh, whatever, uh, Power of Positive, of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale uh, is another book that we're – and so we have five books that we plan on releasing by the end of the year. Um, awesome. Yeah, that, that instill these thought principles. And, and just like that's you right. said, Louis, like – it's for kids, but guess what? I'm getting messages from the parents being like, dude, it's, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to admit how much I learned from this book. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, it, and that's, it, we don't make any money from it, dude. It's like an impact piece, uh -huh. right? Like I'm severely in the red on these books right now, but I'm, uh -huh. uh, I'm excited about it because it's really like the, awesome. it's, it's, the le it's the real legacy stuff, right? It's not uh -huh. like, Hey, I'm, I'm building a big portfolio and that's cool. And that's going to help my family out. But like, how do I make an impact, a bigger impact oh, on the world? And I think mm -hmm. books can really do that. I'm excited for that. Yeah. And, uh, and for every book that we sell, uh, we, we donate a book also to um, a child in need. So if they, um, you know, that, that could be an inner city school organization that could be um, some, some, you know, community that got devastated by a hurricane or a tornado or something. You know? mm -hmm. So like, we, we, we compile a whole bunch of other books and then we donate it to these other organizations and, um, and local communities in order to make sure that they got, they can get the principles too, you know? So, um, they're falling on hard times. It's going to be a good story. It's going to be a good, good philosophy. And hopefully it's a, it's a, you know, a hand up, not a handout kind of a thing. So awesome. uh, yeah, yeah. Little legacy library.com. Appreciate you guys. Let me talk yeah. about it. And I, I uh, feel like 
uh, is also building uh, relationships with for the parents and the kids to uh, be spending time together. Uh, for yeah. sure. And last question from from me. Um, did you? How did you? If you could just summarize how your experience with the one million dollars in in thirty day challenge went, um, for for me and my audience to hear. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, uh, high level on <laughs> that was was I, you know you've seen all these news stories and everybody's talking about how bad the the economy is and how everybody's going broke and we need more stimulus packages and all this. I'm like, I I know entrepreneurs who are in e-commerce and other businesses that are crushing it. They're having their best year ever right now. So like there's mm -hmm. two sides of every single coin. There's whatever side you decide to be on, whichever, right. side, whichever mm -hmm. side of the coin you choose to be on is the one you're going to be on. And if you choose to watch the news and think that the sky is falling and think that everything's awful, guess what? That's what you're going to see in your own life too. Mm -hmm. Versus if you choose to be on the side of profit and you choose to be on the side of um, impact and you choose to be on the side of influence and you choose uh -huh. to be on the side of, um, you know, uh, uh, of resourcefulness, then uh -huh. that's what you're going to get. You're going to get an opportunity out of it instead. And so uh -huh. I remember thinking like, dude, somebody needs to just do this, like just make a million bucks of new revenue inside 30 days and just show people that it could be done in post COVID or in the uh -huh. midst of COVID. Right. And, um, you know, obviously when a thought like that is planted in your head, you're like, damn it, it's my responsibility, right? And so I was, uh, um, I was like, all right, let me, let me do this. And so I, I ended up, um, I ended up uh, uh, sitting there and thinking like, all right, like what are the, it's not, it's not totally fair to say that I made a million dollars from nothing because I, I have connections, I have, you know, mm -hmm. influence, I have social media following and stuff like that. Um, but, but I, I think the important, but I think everybody does, you know, and I think everybody has mm. connections. Everybody has like, regardless of, it doesn't have to be a million dollars, but I think anybody can go out and make an extra 10,000 or a hundred thousand or a million dollars inside 30 days right now with the, with what they have access to immediately. Right. Um, I just picked a million dollars cause it was a big number. And, um, but I think a lot of people could go out and make a hundred thousand dollars like that. So mm -hmm. here's what I ended up doing. I said, hey, I'm going to make a million dollars of new revenue of actual cash that comes in to the bank account in the next 30 days to show and prove that it's even possible. I, and I don't, I don't know. Can I do it? I don't know. I've never done it before, right? Mm -hmm. Of new revenue. Like my, my properties bring in well over, I mean, it's multiple millions of dollars every single month in rents, but that doesn't count. It's got to be new revenue. So um, I just kind of got creative, man. And I started, you know, the first couple of days, I just sat back and I kind of planned. And I was like, uh -huh. all right, what could I offer? And I started looking at the economics and looking at the numbers of it. And, you know, in order to make a million dollars, you could sell 1 million people a $1 product. Uh -huh. Or you can sell 100,000 people a $10 product. Or you can sell, you know, uh, 10,000 people, what is that, a $100 product? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> or, or you can sell, and, but that's, dude, 10,000 sales is a lot of sales, you know? Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah. so for me, I focused on big ticket stuff. I focused on high dollar type things. And, um, and I figured, Hey, or I can sell, you know, a, a, a hundred people, a $10,000 offering, right. Mm -hmm. Or I can sell, uh, 25 people, a $40,000 offering. And so that's what I ended up doing, dude. I launched a mastermind, um, of entrepreneurs. And I started, I just started putting it out there. It was a $24,000 price tag. And I had, um, I don't know. I, I think about half of the revenue of the million dollars came from that. from that. I think we got about 20 people to sign up. And then, mm. um, and that was a year then, long or, or just, um, yeah, it's a year long, but they had to pay okay. up front, you know, cause I had to make it count towards my tally. Right. So yeah, yeah. you gotta, you gotta put the money in now, <laughs> uh, but it's a 12 month commitment. So it's also a liability on my, on my books, but, um, <sighs> it's, it's a pretty decent profit margin. It's a pretty decent margin on that offering. Um, mm. So, uh, so I have that and I, and I like it. And I know there's gonna be more deals that come from doing that over the next 12 months. Cause now I got a bunch of stud entrepreneurs that are coming out to my events mm -hmm. and, uh, we're doing some cool stuff and there's deals that are flowing and, and all sorts of things. So that was about half the revenue. And then the other half was a bunch of real estate type stuff. So, um, I got to work and we took down, um, actually a self storage facility that, okay. that created, uh, some upfront cash and like acquisition fee 
and it created a lot of equity as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and then I got creative on some other stuff, like my vacation rentals got crushed, right? So I had zero bookings and we got really creative on some of the vacation rentals and we mm-hmm. uh, booked up a bunch of vacation rentals, got $25,000, $30,000 of vacation rental income. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the thing is, is what happened, what ended up happening was it wasn't all new cash that came in. And so I started like, I broke it up into two different groups. One was like future equity and future collectibles mm-hmm. um, or receivables, I guess. And then the other stuff was like actual cash that is coming into the account. And yeah. dude, you don't, you don't end up ha- ended up happening by the end of the, the 12 months. I was, I, ab- I was able to create, I think it was about 1.2 million on actual cash that was received. And it was about 1.3 or 1.4 million of equity and receivables that was created as well. And so dude, it was actually, we hit two and a half, just shy of two and a half million dollars of, uh, of revenue. So, um, dude, you do it once. Why can't you do it again? You know, and yeah. if I can do it, why can't somebody else do it? Like you can, right. It's a great testimonial. And so mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily Let's for me, <clears throat> but it was more for like, let, let me inspire, right? Like, let me show people like what's possible. And, um, uh, it, it was just, it was one of those things where like, and then all of a sudden I had all this momentum going into July, you know, I had all this momentum going into some other stuff and it, and it created another month of, I think we did just shy of a million bucks or something. Um, we, we kind of laid off the gas and it was a lot of work for 30 days. Um, I bet. But you, you learn, you learn to lean mm-hmm. on a team. You learn, you start asking yourself like, I'm only me. I have 24 hours a day. Right. So like, how do you start, how do you grow this thing? without me doing 100% of the work. And a lot of people talk about time management. What I learned was time leverage. And mm. leveraging your time mm. is much more resourceful than managing your time. And so That's good. managing your time is more of an, an added type philosophy, adding in, in mathematics, versus mm-hmm. leveraging your time as a multiplication, right? Or even mm. an exponential mm-hmm. factor. Um, in your time. So if you can build a team, I started handing some things off. I, I started looking at my team and other connections. I was like, how can we do something together where you're doing the work, we share in the revenue, but I don't have to do any part of it, you know, but you can lean on me or you can sell my program. We can do a, an affiliate type arrangement or we can do blah, 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 blah. And it mm-hmm. ended up, um, I was able to do some things like that where other people were doing the work and it's, and it's increasing my gross revenue. So, um, mm-hmm that was a big learning piece and uh, something that I'm, I'm actually intentionally trying to maintain and continue and grow um, yeah. as, as my, I continue to grow my business. That's powerful. That's good. Is awesome yeah. stuff. It was cool, man. <laughs> well, Hey, we're closing in on the hour here. I just want to say thank you. We appreciate you and your time. We yeah. love your mindset. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as well. Just uh, quickly share where people can reach you, how they, where they can follow you at, and then uh, yeah. we'll close this out. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you guys can tag me on social media and uh, friend me up on, on Facebook. Um, I'm always trying to put out content on social media. Uh, so TL Bratz is my Facebook um, account. And then at Tim Bratz is my Instagram. I'm also on, uh, whatchamacallit, um, LinkedIn. Not very often, obviously. right? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm about to go, I'm about to do like YouTube um, and go like all in on YouTube. I really like YouTube a lot. I think it's, mm. It's a good platform and stuff. So um, I have a channel called Legacy Wealth on YouTube. So go to Legacy Wealth and um, subscribe there. And we're going to be putting out a lot of content over the course of the next several months and several years. So um, yeah, and then, and then if you guys would go and uh, jump on littlelegacylibrary.com and grab a book, like they're, they're 19 bucks, you know? So grab a book, give it as a gift. It's perfect for like a baby shower, or perfect for um, a young kid's birthday or a niece or a nephew or your own children or your grandchildren or whatever. So um, it's a, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool book. We're super proud of it. There's a lot of yeah. other stuff that goes into it other than just the philosophies, all the, all the kids and all the characters are named after like the Titans of industry, um, like Morgan and, uh, Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie and, um, uh, Ford. And, uh, we, and then we loop in some other like historical characters and there's a lot of awesome artistic type stuff that we do in there too. And then nice. there's like a, a, a take action page at the very end as well. Um, where kids can actually implement a lot of the, yeah. the thoughts and stuff that they, that they got. So littlelegacylibrary.com. And um, yeah, you guys have some great questions. I appreciate you guys having me and i um, excited to be here. So if you want to do it again, hit me up. I'm always available. Yeah.
Awesome. Something uh, you don't know about me, Tim, uh, is that I'm a school teacher. Uh, awesome. So I'm going to see if I can get some copies for my classroom. And, and I just saw the Facebook comments. Some, someone else that is a teacher was like, I'm definitely getting this for my class. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Hopefully it makes yeah. a good If there's something that I can do to help out with the class, if you guys want me to do a Zoom or something or get the, um, the, the actual authors on there to do like a Zoom meeting, I can make that happen. So um, anything that we can do to help contribute, hit me up. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Tim. This was awesome. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. Have a great Have rest a great of the day. Week. You yep. too.